so yeah, I'm, I'm thinking a lot these days about white dwarf cooling and uh, how to how to constrain that and how much we can rely on our models, uh, right? So this this slide goes back to um, you know the the original paper from Leon Mastel. Really, it goes back to my my notes from my class with Lars uh, here at UCSB, graduate stellar structure, or as we call it, stars with Lars. Um, Mastel's cooling law is you know a, pretty easy to understand in terms of a few pieces of physics. You have a you have kind of an interior heat reservoir with some heat capacity of ions. Um, that thermal reservoir needs to be radiated away as luminosity, and there's some sort of uh, narrow region in the envelope that mediates that heat transfer. And when you do that calculation, you get kind of a, a well understood power law for the cooling of, of white dwarfs. Um, and if you look in your favorite stellar evolution textbook, something like Hansen, Kolar, and Trimble, right, you, you see this figure where you've got this power law and uh, some models that were state of the art in 1987, and they more or less line up uh, with, this, with this power law. So um, I think it's always useful to remember this, that we do kind of understand uh, with some decent intuition that um, white dwarfs definitely should be cooling off as they age. And so they're useful as, as clocks on time scales of, of billions of years primarily. Um, but if you want to get the right answer, sorry, this is a slide with a lot of text and you don't have to read it all, right? But um, there's a difference, right, between that power law line on the, on the plot from the textbook and the actual stellar evolution models. Um, so you have to put in some tweaks of pieces of physics that we think we understand, right? We, we need to be a little more detailed. That plot on the previous slide was actually just pure carbon balls representing white dwarfs. But uh, as Mauricio was talking about, a lot, right? There's there's detailed carbon oxygen profiles that affect the, the heat capacity and the thermal properties. You need a, an equation of state that is a little more complicated than just sort of ideal ions as some thermal reservoir. Um, you need opacities to talk about the, the heat transport in the especially in the outer layers that governs the rate at which that that uh, thermal reservoir can be radiated away. And then there are residual sources sources of energy as well, like uh, like crystallization, right? When you get cool enough. Eventually, there's a phase transition, there's latent heat, there's also this process called phase separation um, that induces some mixing, and there's a, an energy budget associated with changing the interior composition profile. Uh, and then maybe there's something like distillation that Simone Bluen has re recently proposed, uh, and I'll get back to that at the very end. Um, so here's a little recap of something I showed in Tubingen. What I worked on uh, earlier this year was implementing this phase separation part. Uh, in MESA. So I've, I've been working a lot with the Stellar Evolution Code MESA to make white dwarf cooling models and trying to make sure that we have all of the relevant input physics um, to get our cooling time scales to be correct or at least state of the art. And those might be different, <laughs> which I'll get into a little more. But um, just to show you what it looks like in MESA, when, I, when I'm going through crystallization, there's latent heat being released. There's also this uh, carbon oxygen profile. Um, this particular Carbon oxygen white dwarf is fairly oxygen rich in the center, about 75%. Um, you know, most of the rest of the stuff is, is uh, carbon, which is this red line. And as crystallization proceeds, what happens is it starts in the center on the left of this plot. And uh, there's a discontinuity in composition at the phase boundary uh, so that you get more oxygen enriched material in the solid state that induces some outward mixing. And as this pre proceeds outward, you rearrange the composition profile in the Mesa model and the net result or as I'm showing, you know, solid lines are the initial configuration, the dashed lines are the final configuration after we're going, we've gone through crystallization, um, and you have transported oxygen toward the core. And that releases some energy, and you get some moderate cooling delay. Um, it's really not that dramatic in terms of uh, sort of the modern physics that we think we understand about crystallization phase diagrams. Uh, so thankfully, Simone Bluen and some others have, have worked hard on getting these phase diagrams right recently. So it kind of used to be thought that the, the cooling delay might be on the order of a giga year. Um, but uh, right now, I think we think it's more, more like half a giga year. So we've actually known this for a long time. Mike Montgomery wrote a, a really nice paper 20 years ago, um, kind of exploring different possible phase diagrams back when we didn't really know the phase diagram for carbon and oxygen very well. Um, but the upshot is the right answer is in this plot from Mike. It's right here. This B curve um, represents a realistic carbon oxygen stratification. Uh, 0.6 solar mass white dwarf is there. 
Um, and with modern phase diagrams, they're more or less like this, this top panel from a plot from Mike. Um, so I did all this work to implement this in Mesa. It's not a very dramatic result. Um, why did I do that? Uh, I think bigger picture is I wanted to start making Mesa white dwarf cooling models that are representative of the state of the art and try to compare to other codes. Um, so now for a lot of the rest of this talk, I'm gonna go through kind of a, an exercise in just the basics of white dwarf cooling uh, to think about something like, what is the simplest thing you could do that hopefully we all agree on, right? We should take a, a standard white dwarf, whatever that means. So to me, that means 0.6 solar masses, right? The mass distribution is very strongly peaked there. Carbon oxygen interior profile, DA white dwarf, standard hydrogen envelope thickness, going through white dwarf cooling, crystallizing, phase separation. This is in a lot of different codes, uh, and I wanted to be able to compare to this. Um, so uh, I'm gonna show this particular plot a lot of different ways now. So I'm gonna try to uh, pause here for just a second to make sure we can all get oriented to exactly what I'm showing. You know, we've seen these plots before. This is a, a white dwarf cooling track. Uh, y-axis is log of luminosity and x-axis is uh, linear scale age. That's kind of often what we care about, especially on time scales of giga years. Um, so we want to hopefully measure the age. If we see a white dwarf and we can measure its luminosity, um, when we know its absolute magnitude from Gaia, we'd like to be able to infer an age from that. Um, and as my starting point for comparison, I think uh, the Montreal models are probably the most widely used by many of us in this room. Uh, the Montreal group has done a great job of hosting these tables of of white dwarf cooling tracks uh, and, and grids that are easy to interpolate in. Uh, and so we use these, I've used these in papers, we use these a lot for mass radius relations and cooling time scales. Um, so I wanted to be able to compare it to these. Um, another code that I think is pretty widely used has very useful tracks is the La Plata code. Um, and this is ostensibly the same thing, right? A 0.6 solar mass white dwarf carbon oxygen, um, and we get a cooling track that looks somewhat similar, but not exactly the same. Um, recently, so we just heard from Maurizio, uh, the BASTI models are, uh, have been updated with some, some pretty recent input physics uh, for their grids of white dwarf cooling models. So uh, he published a really nice paper uh, about that this year. So this green track is uh, what you get if you go into the, the BASTI grid for kind of the same, same assumptions, 0.6 solar mass carbon oxygen white dwarf. Um, and now here's the Mesa track that I've made with, you know, having recently implemented all of these pieces of input physics. Um, so I kind of went through earlier talking about uh, doing careful stuff for phase separation to get uh, a half a giga year cooling delay uh, just right. And the differences here on this plot are significantly more than half a giga year once you get down to crystallization, which I guess I haven't said, but it's, it's down here around uh, a luminosity of 10 to the minus four. Uh, solar luminosities is kind of where the white dwarfs start crystallizing uh, for this particular mass. Uh, and once, especially once you get through crystallization, the cooling time scales are fairly divergent. You have differences of, of more than a giga year, a few giga years. Um, so what else have I not told you about this so far? So, you know, these, the assumptions that I did tell you about are this first set of bullet points. Um, what I forgot to mention was there are a lot more details, right, that go into all of these models. And they differ in subtle ways between uh, these different groups of codes. So the phase diagrams are not exactly the same in what I was showing. Uh, the conductive opacities are different for a few different sets. Um, so there was a recent update, uh, again, from Simon Bluen um, that updates the, the conductive opacities in, in uh, hydrogen and helium mixtures. So that will change the cooling time scale. Um, the equation of state right, affects the thermodynamics. The inter internal carbon oxygen profile uh, makes a difference. Uh, so if I go back here, um, the Montreal track is actually a 50-50 carbon-oxygen mixture. These other tracks are uh, tend to be more oxygen-enriched, but don't match each other precisely. Um, in terms of MESA, I think the input physics is probably most similar to this recent update uh, to the BASTI models. And so we agree, okay, but I, one thing I'd like to understand more in uh, talking with everyone here is what are the residual uh, differences between all these codes. Um, but to, to simplify things a little bit, uh, just to convince you that not everything is terrible, uh, if I want to go to this plot, but just focus on 
comparing a, a couple of these tracks. So now I can compare Mesa directly with Laplata. Um, if I take my Mesa model and uh, currently, the Mesa default is to use the, what I would say is, I think, the most up-to-date conductive opacities from Simone Bluen. Uh, if I roll back to the older version of the conductive opacities, uh, then I get slower cooling that starts to look a lot like this Laplata model. And then, actually, if I dig into this, this particular paper uh, that describes the Laplata models and I try to reproduce their equation of state and phase diagram as well, then dang on, now I agree exactly with this cooling track. Um, so this is encouraging that in a lot of these cases, we can understand where these differences are coming from. Um, but I think the most up-to-date <laughs> MESA model with the physics that we would claim we understand today is cooling uh, surprisingly quite a lot faster um, than the previous Laplata model. Um, so we have all these differences. And to kind of summarize part one before I move on to uh, part two of the, the talk, uh, um, this, is, this is work in progress, so I don't want to sort of claim to have a precise answer about white dwarf cooling time scales, but I'm trying to think a lot right now about what constitutes actual inherent uncertainties, um, and to what extent do we think we can actually nail the, the input physics and just get it right and agree uh, among all these different white dwarf cooling codes, because um, we like to try to measure things with accuracies uh, greater than or more precise than one gig a year. And right now the, the cooling models are not agreeing quite at that level. Um, so I'm really interested in talking with everyone here about what we can do to resolve some of those. Uh, and in the cases that we fail, understand then, does that mean there's an inherent uncertainty in our cooling time scales? Uh, so I had actually an interesting conversation with Bart yesterday um, where he reminded me that back in Austin in 2018, he kind of raised a very similar point in a talk um, when he was thinking about trying to understand what was going on with crystallization. And I think some of the DQ white dwarfs uh, before we really understood that. And he kind of came away with saying, should we really trust these models once you get to crystallization and beyond? Um, and his recommendation was at the time was just no. <laughs> um, I'd like to try to try to understand uh, crystallization to a point where maybe we can agree on what to trust and what not to trust. Um, okay, but then to move into part two, um, now I'm going to make the models a little more complicated by adding in some NEON22 sedimentation. Um, so this is an idea from Lars uh, from 20 years ago that um, NEON22 is kind of left over from the initial metallicity of the, of the star that makes a white dwarf. Um, so if you start at roughly solar metallicity, say 2% metals, um, a lot of that is in carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. And when that gets processed through CNO burning, it ends up in nitrogen. And then in the subsequent phases of, of stellar evolution, that will process up to oxygen 18 and then neon 22. And so you end up with roughly the initial metallicity of star as neon 22 uh, when you're on the white dwarf cooling track. Uh, and neon 22 is a little special because it has a few extra neutrons, uh, which makes it sort of heavier relative to its surroundings. Uh, and so it will sink. And that sink, that sinking of neon 22 transports mass deeper into the gravitational well of the white dwarf star, uh, and that releases some energy that needs to be radiated away, and that causes a cooling delay. Um, and we, we now see signatures of definitely something like this going on in a few different stellar populations. The Q branch is something we've talk, talked a lot about as a community over the last few years. Uh, see how Chang had a really great paper with Gaia data showing that massive white dwarfs on the Q branch are experiencing a very long cooling delay that basically needs to be something going on with Neon22 uh, to explain the energetics involved there. Um, so I want to get into cooling tracks that include Neon22. That's perfect. Um, so these are the previous cooling tracks that I was showing. Uh, I'm going to switch to some cooling tracks that include this extra cooling delay from Neon22 sedimentation. Um, so if I flip back and forth, again, I'm keeping this axis scale constant, trying to just say, show the same plot over and over again. Um, uh, yeah. Um, okay, so the first point to make here is the Montreal models, as far as I know, don't include any Neon22 sedimentation. So those aren't changing. The rest of these are changing. Uh, the Laplata models here are a little complicated because uh, between the 2010 models and the 2016 models, they also changed phase diagrams. So you actually don't see a one-to-one -one, 
uh, cooling delay, the, the track ends up looking pretty similar, but what happened is the, the phase separation cooling delay got to be less, but the NEON 22 delay added in an extra delay. Um, but if you look at, say, the green curve or the black curve here, you see that they're shifting a little bit to longer cooling delays. Um, so the, the first point I want to bring up about this is if you look into the, the various papers that include the NEON 22, along with crystallization and phase separation, um, right now, we're not getting very consistent results about the magnitude of that cooling delay. If we just talk about you know, solar metallicity progenitors, standard CL white dwarfs, the Laplata code produces a pretty long cooling delay of one giga year. Uh, Basti is more like half of a, a giga year. Mesa is even a little bit shorter at 0.4 giga years. Um, and I don't fully understand uh, the reason for this discrepancy. So that's that's one thing I'd like to, to understand more. Um, and I also want to mention that actually it's, it's pretty complicated to think about what's going on when you're trying to do the, the crystallization and the phase separation with the mixing associated with that, possibly turbulent mixing, kind of large scale fluid motions alongside the N22 sedimentation. Uh, so those, those cooling delays are, I think, difficult to implement correctly. And uh, some of these codes, you know, I don't have access to the actual implementations in the code, so I'm a little unsure uh, how to compare my implementations in MESA with these others. Um, and this affects, you know, we've kind of already had a little bit of this discussion about the Q branch specifically. There's a, a nice paper from Maria Kamisasa with the, the LP code trying to explain the Q branch with uh, fairly metal rich models in neon 22 sedimentation. So this would be like 0.06, uh, you know, three times solar metallicity progenitors seem to uh, reproduce the, the Q branch cooling delay in the Laplata models. In Mesa models, you would need more than twice that metallicity to to see the same cooling delay just from sort of standard neon sedimentation where we think we understand the diffusion. Uh, so when I wrote a paper a couple of years ago and, and you know, studying this with Mesa, Lars and I had this uh, suggestion that maybe the neon is sort of clumping up and sinking faster in these larger clumps. Um, that turns out to probably not work in terms of the, the physics of the phase diagram. Um, so there are some inconsistencies there that I'd, I'd like to understand better. Um, and I don't have an answer to that yet. Um, but for the end of this talk, I wanted to switch gears a little bit and talk about a different uh, context in which NEON 22 clearly does matter a lot, but maybe we don't understand it quite as well as we think we did. So there's this really famous result in our field, a really nice paper from Enrique Garcia Barrow and the La Plata group um, using the La Plata code to reproduce the white dwarf luminosity function of this uh, open cluster NGC 6791. Uh, where we have an independent measure of the age from the main sequence turnoff uh, that we're, we're pretty confident is eight giga years. Um, and the famous result here is that with the LP code models, um, they needed phase separation and NEON 22 sedimentation to get enough of a, a cooling delay to reproduce um, the luminosity function. Uh, and NEON 22 is really significant here because it's a, it's a very metal rich open cluster, uh, 0.04, so twice solar metallicity. Um, and just to kind of go back to a version of the spot that I keep showing over and over again, uh, if I put NGC6791 on here, um, eight giga years here, this vertical band is kind of what we think we know is the age independent from white dwarfs. Uh, the faintest white dwarfs in this cluster is this gray band around 10 to the minus four solar luminosities. Uh, and if I put a, a Laplata code model uh, track on here, uh, it looks like this. I don't actually have the precise tracks that they used in that paper, so I'm taking something from Maria Kamisasa's paper uh, and then adding in an extra giga year to kind of correspond to what I think is the NEON 22 delay in a Laplata code model. Um, and I've sort of just sort of made up a, a main sequence progenitor lifetime of about a, a giga year. Uh, and you see this track kind of goes through the box that you want to hit here of the, the right luminosity for the faintest white dwarfs in the, in the cluster at the age of the cluster. Um, if I throw in the Basti models that kind of roughly include the same input physics. They cool a little bit faster, uh, and now they're missing that box. And if I throw on my MESA models, or again, I'm trying to include the same input physics, uh, they cool faster still, and now we're really clearly missing that target. Uh, and so just with standard NEON 22 sedimentation, uh, I kind of wonder if we can reproduce in GC6791. Um, so my suggestion is maybe this distillation idea that uh, Simone Bluen has uh, has suggested is also required by uh, NGC6791. Uh, and I'd like to, to study that more and implement that in stellar evolution codes like MESA. So I'll uh, leave up some 
some conclusions, but I'm out of time. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Evan. Great, thanks, Evan. Can you go back a couple of slides to your target? Uh, I love using, yeah. So uh, you assumed an initial main sequence age, right? For this? Uh, yeah. And so if you add rotation to that main sequence age that prolongs mixing, that prolongs the main sequence life, couldn't you also push your MESA model older in time here and actually fit the data? Like what, what uh, like how, how, how unknown do you think your main sequence age is here? Could, uh, could you fudge that? That might be over-interpreting these tracks a little bit. So th this exercise is a little bit hand-wavy in the sense of it, it's a cartoon. I, the point I want to walk away with is a comparison between the white dwarf cooling time scales, um, kind of like all the all the other assumptions fixed. Um, we're getting, you know, more current models are cooling faster, but I haven't, I have not done a very careful like main sequence. I sort of made up just the main sequence progenitor lifetime for this particular exercise. So this, this is still work in progress on this. So Evan, you could add the globular clusters to this and get a couple of gig years more. Uh, have you done that? Uh, could you explain the question? I'm not, I'm not sure I'm tracking with you. You could add the globular clusters to this diagram. Uh, yeah, so you can sort of do the same kind of exercise with more, more and more globular clusters, right? Is, is that the? Yes. Um, have yeah, I have. I have not done that. I think NGC six seven nine one is is sort of special because it's very, very metal rich and also quite old. Um, so it's it's the most pronounced example uh, that I'm aware of to to try to explain a lot of them. You know, more metal poor ones wouldn't necessarily show as much of a discrepancy. Uh, yeah, just a quick comment about the conductive opacities. Uh, there are still open questions. So there is a nice work by, I don't know if it was by Mauricio Salas or by Cassisi et al, but um, basically there is this kind of intermediate regime where uh, we don't have a good theory for how the conductive opacities behave. So there is some 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 leeway uh, there. Yeah. yeah, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. I, I definitely would like to understand that a lot more and that has, that has a tangible impact on this sort of cooling curve, where if I go back to the others, the, you know, the white dwarf will cool slower for the older con conductive opacities. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> I did not saw uh, this, uh, your try with um, higher uh, traction of hydrogen. Uh, this also uh, affect the delays uh, on white dwarf cooling. I mean, which have been, I mean, just recently in, in 21, I think, it has been published uh, with uh, global cluster M3 and M13, where uh, higher uh, outer uh, hydrogen fraction has delayed around one giga year of uh, um, cooling time at around uh, uh, log L of uh, minus four. So. Uh, You're talking about the thickness of the hydrogen yes. envelope? Yeah, yes. yeah, I, I definitely agree that um, that yeah. makes a difference for, that, for different models. Uh, my focus here is tr really trying to show different codes with the same assumptions. So for the particular tracks I'm showing, you know, the assumption on the hydrogen envelope thickness is, is roughly the same on the order of 10 to the minus four solar masses for this. Um, but yeah, it, it, you're very much correct that uh, different codes will, will get different cooling ages as well as you start to vary that parameter. Uh, nice talk. Um, yeah, so I'll just throw it out there. Um, so to what extent do you think um, these white dwarfs, particularly say on, on the Q branch or whatnot, actually originate from all of them actually originate from single stellar evolution? Um, and I mean, do you think if they don't, to what extent might this put a wrench into or not into your modeling? <laughs> That's a great question. I think, yeah, there's a lot there. Um, yeah. I think probably many of them do originate from mergers. Uh, that might tweak the internal composition somewhat, but I don't think it actually has a huge impact on, say, like the Neon 22 abundance. Um, and then, yeah, there are a lot more details in terms of the population synthesis that I think, you know, see how I had a pretty nice paper on this as well, that probably not all of them are mergers. And even if they are, the, the sort of like merger delay doesn't really get you to 
the order of magnitude of the cooling delay that you need to match the observations. So I think you, it seems pretty secure to me that, that things like in the, in the Q branch need to have some like extra physics going on. Uh, and you know, now I'm kind of arguing maybe in GC6791 as well. There's, we need more of these new physical processes that can cause a large delay. Um, quick thing, uh, metallicity matters. Yeah. And solar metallicity is not the same for every code. <laughs> so I think that the first, first thing first, uh, you all codes should give what they, for them is solar metallicity, which means reproducing the sun. And from there, you will have a pre white dwarf age to actually compute uh, those. So I think that, and also I think that half giga year is absolutely untraceable and mm -hmm. uh, it's not really significant. Sorry. <laughs> so Evan, just on the, the possible merger front, um, depending on the, how the merger proceeds, if it's not a complete merger, but, but if the lighter star unwinds, on top of the more massive star, um, then you could have a very strange core profile starting out with, mm -hmm. with a, a bunch of carbon and oxygen sitting on top of the, the single star evolution core. Um, and so I think it's at least possible that the, the phase separation of, of that, um, you know, I mean, maybe it just goes ahead and completely mixes quickly, but if it doesn't, there, there could be some extra delay um, due to that, that very non-standard profile. Yeah, I'd, I'd be interested in sort of sketching that out a little more and, and trying to, I, my impression is that the really crazy configurations you might come up with would tend to be unstable and mix very quickly early in the cooling track and not affect it. But if maybe you could do something a little more subtle, then that would be interesting to, to try to come up with something like that. Okay, let's thank Evan again.